All right, this is fantastic. Great turnout. I really appreciate everyone coming here, even though it's supposed to be a cataclysmic stage eight one inch snowstorm. But we're New Yorkers, so that shouldn't be a big deal. Uh, I'm going to try to be as brief as possible. I usually tend to drone on a little bit too long at the beginning of these things, but we've got a wonderful, brilliant set of panelists. I just want to say a couple of things, because this, for me, is very much the joining of many of my worlds. And I can't tell you how thrilled I am to have Jim Kohlenberg, uh, Kohlenberger come up from DC, because that really is my past colliding with my present. But I want to... Uh, Everyone knows that Brooklyn is a home for creatives, innovators, technologists, new entrepreneurs. We sometimes forget that Brooklyn is also the home of revolution. Has anyone ever been down to Fulton Landing and read what happened at Fulton Landing? So 1776, the British are amassed above, uh, 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 up in Brooklyn Heights. Rag 30,000 troops, I think, amassed in the Heights, ready to just completely devastate the remnants of Washington's ragtag army. Fog rolls in. Washington and his remaining troops, they've been defeated all the way down from Bunker Hill into Brooklyn. Fog rolls in, and they ferry across to Manhattan and keep the British at bay. And that was, in my mind, the turning point of the great experiment, the American Revolution and the great experiment in democracy one of the first revolutions to occur right here on our Brooklyn soil. Then you look around Brooklyn, you drive around the neighborhoods of Brooklyn, what do you see? You see, until 10 years ago, you saw a lot of empty warehouses. You go down to the Navy Yard, empty warehouses, Dumbo, empty warehouses, Red Hook, empty warehouses. Now what do you see? First you saw the home of all the incubators, the new media, food, uh, internet, um, all the new startups emerging in Brooklyn from folks who decided they're gonna take over this wonderful warehouse space and create new ideas. Now what are we seeing in the past five years? We're seeing our old factories, our old warehouses, now being converted. We re this was the home of the Industrial Revolution 100 years ago. You look at our factories, our empty factories. These, this, this was the hotbed for the Industrial Revolution. World War II, some say, was won in large part because of the 85,000 people that were deployed to work in the Navy Yard and build the armaments and ships for World War II. Those warehouses have now been, once fallow, have been repurposed and converted into the warehouses for what I'm looking at when I look at this panel as the pioneers of the digital industrial revolution. One more statement about Fulton Landing over here. It's named Fulton Landing after Robert Fulton. This was a pioneering experiment in deploying uh, steam technology for the first commercial ferries that went from Fulton Landing in Brooklyn to Fulton Landing in Manhattan. Uh, you look at the Brooklyn Bridge. It was built by a guy from New Jersey, but it was built for, <laughs> for us to connect uh, two great cities, the city of Brooklyn and the city of uh, Manhattan. Uh, in any case, I want you to sort of treat this, and I, I think people understate. I'm really Pollyannish and uh, uh, bullish on what the future of 3D printing is. It really is in its very nascent stage. But when I look at it, I look at the 21st century as the century of fashion and design, where everyone now, you look at what's going on in new media, everyone now has the power of the publisher in their hands. Anyone can reach anyone or any combination of people in the world because of the power of the internet and digital distribution. We are now seeing that take shape in the world of 3D printing. We are, we, we've got the, the first builders of the dot matrix printers of the 3D revolution here. I don't know if that's fair to say, but I'm going to let them and talk about it. What I want to do really is hand it off to Jim now. I think we've got, we've got uh, three, I think, what, well, we've got Make Magazine here also, but in addition to that, we've got pioneers in three different business models of 3D printing. You've got your uh, consumer desktop products in the, you know, MakerBot is sort of pioneering that model. You've got Shapeways where you can send in your stuff and they'll send it back to you, you know, customized, tailor-made for you. And you've got D-Shape, which is on the other end of the spectrum building incredibly huge 3D printed objects. Um, but with that, I want to hint to Jim, and uh, I, I saw Jim a few months ago, and I thought, God, if we're going to do an event on the future of making, there's no one better than Jim who combines, first of all, the fanaticism for the subject. He's the only person I know who's apparently spending all his money on uh, 3D printed objects, and he'll tell you more about that. But I've worked in the past, uh, uh, over the past uh, more than a decade with Jim 
uh, in DC policy circles. And Jim has been always the most thoughtful, sophisticated, decent advocate for any new technology. So my ulterior reason for bringing Jim up and for insisting that he get to know each one of these guys, we've got some serious tech policy hurdles in front of us. Everyone see yesterday that the guy who is pioneering the production of the 3D gun just got a license to uh, a permit to sell guns. Uh, I know it's probably important if we can figure out ways to become good actors in the 3D printing world. I don't know if it's doable, I don't know how it's doable, but I'd like to think that with the folks on the dais here and with you all in the audience, we can hack some viable solutions to make, to, to realize the full promise of 3D printing without experiencing too many of the growing pains and too much of the downside of 3D printing. So with someone, a brilliant DC insider like Jim, if we can prevail upon him to be a mouthpiece for this new emerging community, I think we could go a long way to show the world, the politicians, uh, uh, the industry, uh, uh, humanity, the promise of 3D printing while still demonstrating to the world we can be good actors as we uh, promote the digital industrial revolution. So with that, I want to hand it to Jim. Uh, and it, Jim, it's just so great to see you. Thank you, Jonathan. Well, you know, it's, it's, it's great to be here. It's great, and a big thanks to Jonathan. I've always known him as someone who's been, you know, passionate about the future and always looking around the corner um, as to where the future will head and helping chart a path for that, um, that brighter future. We're going to have a great conversation here tonight. And, you know, it strikes me that, uh, you know, every once in a generation, a new technology comes along that has the potential to transform just about everything. You know, think printing press, steam engine, uh, telegraph, personal computer, and, and now 3D printing. Um, and 3D printing, you know, which has the ability to transform ideas and inf information into, into physical things. It has that ability to transform us from consumers of things into uh, creators of things. It helps us uh, imagine the unimaginable uh, to make the unmakeable and create the unthinkable. And, you know, you, if you think about it, uh, last year, right, uh, The Economist magazine uh, called this the third industrial revolution. Uh, and NPR took a look at 3D printing, and they said, don't call them printers, call them the magic box that can make anything. Uh, and even the President of the United States in his State of the Union uh, came out and said, you know, this has, you know, 3D printing has the ability to transform um, uh, our ability to make almost everything. And it really is an amazing time, and there's amazing things that are happening. And it, it reminds me, Jonathan, you know, mentions all the history here in Brooklyn, but it reminds me of another time in spring of, uh, in January of 1975, on the cover of Popular Science Magazine was a picture. And it was a picture of a box uh, called the Mitz Altair 8800. For $400, you could buy a kit and actually make a computer. Computers had been around for... Um, a long time in a mainframe um, form, but suddenly you could buy a kit for 400 bucks. And my brother and I, we bought and built one. We had no idea what it would be used for, but we knew that computers were gonna be the, um, the future. It had no software that would run on it. Uh, it had no peripherals. Uh, that's how stupid we were, buying a box that... Um, but amazingly, and a revolution happened. Two months after that magazine cover, uh, another kid uh, named Bill Gates uh, wrote something called Altair Basic. Um, and started a revolution of his own. That same month that he wrote that program, another kid, Steve Wozniak, started the Homebrew Computer Club uh, in what would become, really, Silicon Valley. And Steve Wozniak, as you may know, teamed up with another Steve, uh, and they looked at that Altair uh, 8800 and figured out how to make it simpler, more user-friendly, and apparently they sold a lot of fruits together um, over time. Um, but amazing thing happened, and, and, and this revolution happened in, in personal computing. And here we're at a, a similar inflection point, I think, in uh, 3D printing, where things are happening, amazing things are happening. And instead of Silicon Valley, a lot of it's happening right here in Brooklyn. That fire that Jonathan talked about uh, is happening here. And you think about uh, some of the things that are happening. Right now, today, right, there's 30,000 people walking around with 3D printed titanium hips. Pretty amazing. All kinds of, it's influencing everything from uh, medicine to movies, from food to fashion, from the way that we educate to the way we innovate. Amazing things are happening, but the best is yet ahead. I mean, now people are talking about, scientists are working on nanoscale printers, that things that can print atom by atom. 
Um, and you know, when you do that, you can make magical new properties out of, uh, out of new things uh, that come along. And just last week, a company announced that they've got a, a nanoscale printer that's coming out in the next quarter. Uh, so it's coming down the pike. Uh, if you think 3D is not enough, uh, some people are working on 4D, uh, things that you can print that change form uh, over time. If you think that's out of this world, NASA's working on their next rocket and they're building parts with uh, 3D printers. Last week, a group of folks in Iowa, a group of scientists, uh, said that in three to five years, we're going to be printing uh, human uh, body parts. We'll see if that's true or not. Um, but amazing things are coming down the pike. And we've got an exceptional group of visionaries, of futurists, who are going to help us guide us uh, in this conversation uh, tonight. And, and first, I want to introduce uh, you know, Rob Steiner, who really is um, he's the director of uh, product development at, at MakerBot. He helped design and develop the new Replicator 2 and 2X um, machines, which are uh, really phenomenal. I call them the uh, amazing magical boxes of goodness. Um, but they're, they're phenomenal. One, and one thing, you know, you think about uh, Henry Ford, right? So he transformed manufacturing um, uh, in a big way to be able to make it more available to the masses. And what I like is that Rob stole an idea from uh, Henry Ford and made the replicator available in any color uh, as long as black. And, um, but interestingly, uh, now Ford Motor Company stole an idea from him. And so Ford engineers are now sitting there designing new things, um, all with MakerBots um, on their desks. And it's a phenomenal, um, a phenomenal story. Um, to, uh, to his left, we've got uh, JF Branding, um, uh, who's with uh, D-Shape, which is a mega scale, free form uh, 3D printer. He's been in, the, in this field for a while looking at uh, really creative uh, things. And if, if you think about it, he's really somebody who really thinks big uh, in this area uh, in terms of building scale. Uh, they helped make the uh, largest uh, piece of 3D printed art that came into the U.S. Uh, he was a finalist for uh, a prize for uh, how do you use 3D printing to uh, help the developing world. And he's uh, uh, truly an international man of, of mystery. Um, and we've got um, uh, Brian uh, Jepson, who's an editor with uh, Make Magazine, and he's he's um, he's a hacker, uh, he's a writer, he's written a lot of uh, wonderful geeky books. Go buy them. Um, and the uh, but he's also in Rhode Island, um, has been one of the organizers of the Maker Fair there. And I, you know, I come from Washington. I come from the White House, and we used to get into these conversations with Congress and other people who said, "Are the best days of America ahead of us or behind us?" And I would always point them to Maker Fairs and Make Magazine because if you take a look at this and you take a look at the innovation that's happening, there is no way you do not think that the best days are ahead of us uh, with the kind of ideas uh, that are coming forward. And we've also got uh, Dwan Scott, who's a design uh, evangelist uh, for Shapeways, and. And you know he's got this great and varied background, one of the real visionaries in this field, and thinking about uh, how you uh, pull it all together. And you know it, what, what's amazing is you know Mayor Bloomberg came down and did the uh, ribbon cutting uh, last year, um, and really put uh, high-end 3D printing uh, machines within the uh, reach of each of our mailbox to be able to do, so I think, some really tremendous, exciting things. And, so we've got this wonderful group of, of panelists, and we're going to talk about the future. We're going to start with Rob. Yeah, yeah, either, uh, yeah, sit down. Okay. Hi, thanks for the invite. Appreciate it. Uh, I'm Rob Steiner from MakerBot. I run the product group, which is uh, mechanical, electrical, and software engineering teams, as well as R and D, uh, and uh, the support team. So if you have an issue with your machine, uh, the help desk for for computers, I guess. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with 3D printing at least for our machines, the way I like to describe it is when you go to the deli and you see that big block of cheese and you say, I need a, a quarter pound, and they put it in there and they, they move it back and forth and those slices fall off and they give it to you, 3D printing is very similar to that. We take a solid object in software and we slice it and then we stack it up. And so that's how you create a solid object using our technology. So the sort of show and tell I have in front of me are all objects that are, if, uh, and there were some giveaways, I'm assuming they're all gone by now. But, uh, so this, for example, was in the Wired magazine, and uh, the artist Marius I can't, Watts, I think is his last name, 
And uh, this was his design. And it's available on Thingiverse, which is uh, a repository of models that, that we have. It's free. And what he did was he used the design software and he took it in and then it's sliced. Each individual slice in our uh, software makerware and our printer runs basically a hot glue gun head. So remember the hot glue gun, you push it in, it kind of squirts out and it runs a pattern. And it traces just that first slice on what we call a layer at the base. And then we have a, uh, the Z stage or the stage of our printer. It drops it down just a little bit and it runs another one and then another one and another one. And then you end up with this object or any of these objects. So it follows the same process each time. Uh, we're real proud of our machines. Uh, a lot of work went into them. Uh, you saw it on the cover of Wired. Uh, we recently at CES in January released our newest machine, which is the Replicator 2X, and it's an experimental printer. Uh, it's uh, designed for sort of the, we always say, somebody who might want to make their own flamethrower. Uh, but uh, it, it uses a different, uh, a different material than our, our current uh, unit. So everything that I have here with the exception of this is made out of PLA, which is a, a corn-based bioplastic. It's, it's biodegradable. Uh, it uses less energy to print. Uh, I, I personally like it. It smells a little bit like uh, syrup or um, waffles that, uh, when, it's, when it's heating. Uh, the, we also have ABS, which is more like a Lego type of plastic. And that's uh, more durable and more flexible. We found that designers and art, at least designers and artists tend to prefer the PLA and the engineers like the ABS. That's why we have two machines. And it fills our, our marketplace. Um, I don't know, show and tell. Uh, let's see, what else? We are located in Brooklyn. And we went from, when I started uh, just over about a year ago, we were in a tiny space that was about the size of that uh, jury box right there with everybody all jammed in. And now I think we're in 30,000 square feet across the street at uh, one Metro Tech. We went from, when I started 65 employees, we're now at 170 and growing. Uh, that's in one year. Uh, we're hiring. <laughs> so if, if uh, you're interested, check out our website. Um, let's see what else. That's about it. Excellent. Um, Hello. Oh, you got some slides. Yeah, I got yeah. some slides. So I was hoping to go front. Uh, yeah. I suppose I can use this. Hello, can you hear me? Um, I'm part of D-Shape. Uh, it's technology that we've developed out of Italy. Uh, the inventor was called Enrico Dini. He's a genius. You've probably heard about his work. Um, you've seen it, seen it everywhere. I'm going to show you some images and talk about the technology a little bit more and talk a little bit perhaps about the future as well, at least, at least our vision for the future. Um, you might recognize a lot of the images um, because we're sort of a new company and we're getting out there. I just want to talk a little bit about what I think about the future, just, just as a little explanation. I mean, nothing ages faster than visions for the future. Nothing ages faster than sort of coming up with ideas and how we're going to see the future, but it shouldn't stop us from like trying to think of something because we might get a little bit wrong, but it's amazing what we get right. The one thing I feel very strongly about is that jobs never will be destroyed by automation. Um, a lot of people feel in some ways that as we automate manufacturing, construction, and so forth, that we're actually removing jobs away. That's never been, never happened before and it's never going to happen in the future. One thing is true is that it does make every one, one of you more able to do creative work. And I think that, at least in terms of what we're doing and what MakerBot's doing, what, what Shapeways is doing, and what Make Magazine is also encouraging, is everyone to become a designer. I just want to show you some images from like what people thought of the future at least 100 years ago, just to get like sort of a joke of going. Because I mean, <laughs> we always think of the future, it, it just never turns out right. But sometimes you get it right. Sometimes you can actually think of automation and construction and get quite close. And that's the way we want to see it. We want to see an architect, arch the vision of an architect, these ideas essentially get turned into what he wants more or less imme immediately. So how the hell do you print 3D concrete? Like, how does that work? I mean, MakerBot uses plastic. Well, if you think about it, cement and water combine to make concrete. And essentially what we've done, essentially, is have a layer of sand, a material is deposited in a very thin layer, cement, and then something rather like your inkjet printer, printer head essentially deposits a liquid. But this is on a massive scale. I mean, this machine is 20 by 20 feet. It's a huge design. We've basically just taken the basic model of a 3D printer and expanded it to gargantuan size. 
So you can see here, like the machine basically depositing the material, and then layer by layer you build up the object, and then of course you remove the material. And there's a million uses for this kind of technology. Think of it. Um, you can't think of anywhere where the concrete isn't used, uh, whether it be you know garden furnishings or actual construction purposes. Um, and there's a huge advantage to actually using 3D printing technology in concrete uh, in, in, in where concrete is used. You can have quick turnaround. You can have greater freedom of design. You don't need form work or anything to actually, you know, that you have to make before you actually fill it with concrete. You do away with all that. So, I mean, we've actually made, made some, some interesting applications for this kind of stuff. I mean, I'm going to show you some more images. But you can see a lot of different applications and where we're going to go with this. And you can see in perhaps 30 years, 3D printed concrete is going to be pretty prevalent. So here's some examples of stuff we've been thinking up of. We're working on a, one project perhaps in Italy. It's going to be a sort of water theme park. These are some other pictures of uh, one image at the bottom is actually a coral reef structure that we made for a Bahraini firm. Um, there are some other sculptural pieces. One of those pieces there was made by uh, the internationally known uh, design firm uh, Freedom of Creation. Um, here's a big structure we made. Um, it's under construction right now, and it's supposed to stand about, I'm thinking on my head, about 30 feet tall. So you can get an idea. This, this thing makes big stuff. Here's some other stuff we've actually made, like tables, um, benches for a couple of other firms in uh, Europe. This is an actual house we printed, full one-piece house. Um, you can actually see that we even printed the table inside, which I'm very proud of. Um, and some other sort of uh, pieces we made. Um, if you look at that image on the far right, I mean, that's me. <laughs> it's a big piece. I mean, basically goes almost to the, re almost to the ceiling. I mean, it's unbelievable how, how big we can make these kind of pieces. So, I mean, like, what's the use? Where are we going to be in 30 years using this type of technology? What's, what's it going to be? Well, it's organic and freeform architecture. I think for a very long time we've gone with straight lines in every single building, brutalist, modernist architecture. It's not that it's bad. I mean, I'm sure these architects have great visions, but the tools they had at the time for the past 50, 60 years were limiting. And they wanted to make structures cheap and efficient, so they went with straight lines. So with our technology, it's quite possible to you know, add a sort of organic aesthetic, you know, arc of nature, if you might want to call it. Um, and, I, and I think that's a really important thing if we want to live in cities that we would appreciate for their aesthetic purposes as well as, as their functional purposes. Some other uses. I mean, if you leverage, if you have a machine that can basically make any sort of concrete structure, you can, you can do some really you know, radical things. Um, I got in contact with a uh, architect in London named Eva Feidich, and she actually worked on essentially taking columns and reorganizing, running them through an evolutionary CAD program to reorganize the structure. Essentially, putting in the computer, putting this column under stress, simulated stress, and then having the internal lattice structure be reorganized again and again and again, essentially evolving the structure to become lighter, more efficient, and using less material. So if you think about it that way, all the columns that make up a building could be evolved so that they can support more more people, more make bigger buildings, use less material, all the sort of things that you would want to see in more modern buildings. How about this? Using nanotechnology, we've been experimenting uh, with using uh, nanoparticles. Um, it's actually a commonly used material, titanium dioxide nanoparticles. They've been adding it to concrete um, to make self-cleaning materials. But it depends solely upon the surface area that it comes in contact with air. I mean, this is really radical stuff. The problem is, is that mold work for making concrete is, is very limited. You can only make so much surface area, but if you increase the surface area of wall structure and you have, it's been sprayed with this nano material, it's able to clean air faster. This, is, this isn't stuff in the future. This could be happening now, and it's going to be used more and more in the next 30 years. And what I'm coming, with, coming down to is I think that construction, at least with this type of technology, is going to become more white collar. It's going to become more technical. I mean, labor, uh, construction is a very labor intensive sort of industry. But if there's a sort of sense of automation with construction, I think people are going to come out of you know construction and architecture and so forth. They're going to actually, instead of actually working on the buildings themselves, they're actually going to become more, more designers. I think there's going to be more people working on the design elements of buildings rather than the actual construction part. And there's some other ideas we're thinking of. For example, 
think about the you know dilapidated uh, infrastructure in America. There's some big problems there. There's bridges collapsing. Um, there's there's potholes that need to be filled, and it's much more expensive to do it now than it ever has been. Think of this situation. Let's think about the worst road you've ever been on. It's full of potholes. Well, imagine how many road crews it would take to fill that. Well, what if you did this? What if you had a laser scanner? You scan the pothole, and then off-site someone takes that design, uses the reverse of it, prints a piece, goes on site, deposits it, filling the whole thing up, and you've quality controlled the piece. You didn't have to like throw some asphalt down and wait for a little bit and let it dry. You had to like block off half the traffic and we all know how bad that it gets when you do it in Manhattan. You know, if you can do it more or less immediately, you're saving costs because you're not disrupting traffic and you've actually controlled quality so of the material so it's going to last forever. That's where it's going to be going in terms of fixing America's infrastructure. Think about this this idea. I mean, if you have a building, there's a lot of energy that was put into that. I mean, it's, it's it, it, creating concrete is a very energy-intensive process. You want to basically extend the life cycle, uh, the embodied energy, essentially, of that material. Well, what if you could actually take the rubble of a destroyed building, use that material to reprint with? This isn't something that we're just thinking of as an idle thought. This is something that we can do right now. And, of course, printing on the moon. I mean, there's a lot of things that uh, we've been doing, but this is one thing that's certainly gotten a lot of attention in the media. We have been uh, working with the European Space Agency to go to the moon. And why would you want to use 3D printer on the moon? Well, it's pretty simple. If you want to use any material, if you can use any material, you probably want to use the material that's on the moon. And secondly, you don't want to use any formwork. You don't want to have to bring anything with you. It's pretty expensive to get anything into lower orbit or even to the moon. You want to actually have used everything there. You want to have a CAD design sent all the way from, from Earth, and then you want to print it there. And so we're working with Foster's, uh, the well-known architecture firm and European Space Agency to explore these, the feasibility of these kind of things. That's it. Thank you. I think if my wife were here, I think she'd be uh, on you to, to uh, print us a bathroom that was one of those self-cleaning kinds. Well, yeah. I'll give you my card. Okay. <laughs> Brian? Wow, uh, I'm, I'm still on the moon. That was pretty cool. Um, I'm Brian Jepson. I'm a senior editor with Make. I focus on the, the books side of thing over at Make and actually out in the hallway for sale, one of the books that I edited, Getting Started with MakerBots out there. Uh, buy it. You know, it's, it's really good. I, I can say that because I didn't write it. I just watched, watched it being written and it was pretty awesome. Um, I'm really excited about how 3D printing allows us to make things with intelligence and there really has two meanings for me. One is that we can bring a new sort of intelligence to the design process. Um, I'm a big fan of design, but I'm also in a previous life, uh, I was a computer programmer, and I'm also a really big fan of computer programming and in, in the larger picture concepts like computational thinking as just if we can think about problems uh, and solve them using computer programming algorithms that really excites me. And this has been a really cool year for MakerBot. You guys have come out with some really cool innovations, but my favorite innovation so far, or maybe this came, I'm not sure if this was this year or last year, but it was recent, was, was the customizer, uh, which allows you to take models that are up on Thingiverse that have parameters. For example, the width, the height, the number of tentacles that Great Lord Cthulhu has, all sorts of stuff like that, um, and vary it. But, the, but what enables that are designers who have created and shared models that are written using a, a programming language. It's either called Open SCAD or Open SCAD. I always Open SCAD. Open SCAD. I always Open say, SCAD. yeah, it's you write lines of code, and and that generates a 3D model. You're not sitting there dragging and dropping cubes and spheres and blending them together. You're actually writing a computer program, and and customizer hooks into that, you set some variable declarations at the top, and these become the attributes that any user who doesn't that week, you know, they're not inclined to learn how to program, but my belief is that, I mean, the great thing about Thingiverse is that shortly after getting your 3D printer, you go from downloading things and printing them to wanting to make things yourself. And so customizer, to me, is the greatest stealth introduction of computational thinking I've seen in quite a while because it's actually going to trick people into doing computer programming, which is super. So that furthers one of my agendas. 
The other things, uh, making things with intelligence, there's, is with 3D printing, we're actually making things with intelligence in them. I love to go to Thingiverse and browse everything from enclosures for Raspberry Pis to enclosures for Arduinos, all the way up to robotic chassis. Um, 3D printed robots is the thing that excites me the most right now. So the, the 3D printing isn't just showing us how to make more stuff that we clutter our house with. I mean, it's definitely doing that for me. I have a lot of crap. <laughs> but it's, it's enabling us to make things with our own intelligence and, and, and also to stretch our intelligence to um, a, a space that I'm really comfortable with you all stretching it to. Um, and not too far, you know, we don't want to get too crazy, but also making things that, that are smart, making little, you know, everything from robots to things that hold robot brains. And, and this is what really excites me about what 3D printing enables. And Juan? Yeah. I got pictures. I well, as we we're waiting, you know, I'm hoping that uh, Brian's next book it won't be printed just in 2D, but in 3D. I noticed that his business cards are already in 3D. So I'm hoping his next book will be a, a 3D printed. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll get working on the 3D printed book. Yeah. Excellent. All right. Hi. <clears throat> That's loud. I'm Juwan from Shapeways. Um, I guess if you're going to think about the future of 3D printing, what it means, we should know what's happening now first. So um, does, who knows what 3D printing is really and where it came from? Cool. That's half-ish. So 3D printing is a catch-all phrase for a bunch of technologies, which is about additive manufacturing. And it used to be called rapid prototyping, and it was a way for engineers and designers to test a product before they took it to market, because if you make a mistake on a mass-produced item, it's an expensive mistake. If you make a mistake with a 3D printed product, it's a relatively cheap one. And so historically, 3D printing has been about engineers, make, engineers making mistakes fast, so they don't make expensive mistakes later on. Um, when it first started, the materials were kind of low quality, and the, the parts were just for appearance or for testing the ergonomics or the fit, but they weren't quality materials. And it was really expensive to get something 3D printed. But in the last four, four years or so, with the, the MakerBot and the RepRaps and the Ultimakers, and with companies like Shapeway, Sculpteo, I Materialized, Pinoco coming out, it's made 3D printing much, much cheaper. And so we've seen, with the um, increasing qualities and the decreasing price, we've seen 3D printing come into normal people's hands. Um, I'm just going to quickly go. There's, there's some major technologies which are, which are 3D printing. There's SLS, which is laser sintering. DMLS, which is uh, metal laser sintering, SLA, which is lasers and vats of liquid, um, DLP, which is um, UV cured resins, um, electron beam melting, which is hardcore direct metal laser sintering. There's LOM, which is basically layers of paper or metal or plastic laid together, glued together, then cut-ish. And powder bed printing, which is either plaster or ceramics or glass or steel, which is basically glued together and then... Um, Produce, which is kind of how the uh, D shape work, I, I guess, is powder bed printing. Yeah, it's a chemical yeah. base printing. Yeah, so there's these these base technologies which sort of grouping together is 3D printing, and they're, each one has its own material properties and its own process, its own its own advantages and disadvantages. So we say 3D printing, but it's lots of different things that it's combining. Now I'm with Shapeways. We're an online 3D printing community marketplace service where anyone can make anything they want using 3D printing in the materials we have. So you basically, you just upload your design. Um, you have to design it maybe, or download it from Thingiverse, or use the, um, what, what are you calling your creator? The, um, the customizer. Any, any way you can create a 3D file, you can do it in Minecraft, send it to us, uh, we'll 3D print it and send it to you. Then if you want to sell your design, you can sell it on Shapeways um, in the marketplace we have. You can specify how much money you make each time it sells. So if a third party wants to buy that product, we'll um, make it, we'll take the money off them, we'll make it for them, send it directly to them and send you the profit. So it's a way for designers to make a passive income from their designs, which has sort of never really been able to be done before in the history of awesome. Um, so apart from being awesome, why, why 3D printing? Why do we care? One of the major things is complexity is free. 
In any other manufacturing technique, the more circles you add, the more cuts you do, the more complexity you add, the more expensive it gets. But with 3D printing, this is not the case because really you're just paying for the amount of material you use. So you can make something fit exactly for what you need because you don't have to make a mass producing. When we mass produce things, we make it for everybody because we're trying to make it as cheap as possible, exactly the same. Um, and with 3D printing, you can make something especially for you because this complexity, this customization is free. In the bottom uh, left-hand corner, the Strand Beast is based on a sculpture by kinetic artist Theo Janssen. Now this is 3D printed in nylon with a laser sintering machine. It has 72 moving parts and it comes out the machine fully assembled, fully articulated. So absolute complexity. And talking about algorithm-based designs, in the top center is a bracelet, bracelet by a couple out of MIT called Nervous System. And what they do is they grow their designs. So they write their own software to write their own algorithms which emulate um, the, uh, the processes of nature. So this is a, based on a cell cycle of how bone structure works. And what they do is they, they, they build the design and when they, they sort of grow it, they press play and the and design starts to evolve over time. And when they're happy with the design, they press pause and print. And so they're not really designing the thing by pushing geometry around or, as you say, cubes and circles and doing booleans and boring CAD stuff. They're, they're really growing designs. And then they make this available for other people to do as well. So hopefully in my next slide. Has a... ah. And then you can see in the, in the center left is their app they've made. So you can go onto Nervous System's site. You can grab their cell cycle ring and you can modify it. You can twist it and twirl it and grow it. You can make it into a bracelet or into a pinky ring or any size you want. Um, when you're happy with it, you can press print. It'll plug into the Shapeways API. It'll send it to us. We'll print it for them. They'll send it back to Nervous System. They'll package it up, send it to you. And you've got this customized item, whatever that might be, made especially for you. And it's no more expensive to make a thousand exactly the same as your one or a thousand different ones because all you're paying for is the amount of material used. So this complexity and free customization means you don't have to um, make do with something that's close enough. If you need a mount for your camera so it holds your light next to your microphone with the flash, you can design it and print it exactly for your camera and your microphone and your light and your flash. You don't have to get a generic one off the, off the shelf and then use gaff tape to fix it. You can make exactly what you need. And so the, dis the distance between what you want and what you need is getting much, much closer with 3D printing. With that, with our marketplace, the other thing is you can print one of a thing, or three of a thing, or a thousand of a thing, it doesn't matter. There's no, there's no barrier to entry, there's no minimum order quantity. So supply exactly meets demand. Now this is important for a few reasons. One is um, there's no risk. So if you design a Raspberry Pi case and no one buys it, you don't have 10,000 Raspberry Pi cases underneath your um, bed in two years time because there's no minimum order quantity. Yet if you get an order for a lot of them all of a sudden, uh, we can print heaps of them, send them off. A good example of this is uh, Joshua Harker. He's an artist based in Chicago. He was trying to raise $500 so he could take his, his three printed skulls and his artwork and show it at a gallery in Chicago. All he wanted was money for beer and, and invites. Um, after two days on Kickstarter, he raised $19,000. After a month, he made 77 k So suddenly, uh, he had to fulfill 1,000 orders of three printed skulls. So he um, uploaded his design to Shapeways, um, sent us some money, and we printed a thousand skulls, shipped three pallets of skulls to his door in Chicago. Now, if he was using any other uh, manufacturing method, he would have had to pay money up front, so he would have invest beforehand. He would have had a minimum order, so they would have said, you need at least 3,000 of these. And he would have had to wait. If he got it produced in China, he would have um, basically um, made his Kickstarter back as wait for three months at least. And so, so for, for him, there was absolutely no risk in this venture. All there was was gain. And this, and this project changed his life. He went from doing work for other people to just pursuing his art all of the time. And you know, it's, I don't think this has ever really been possible before. And 3D printing helps to enable that. As well as making new products or new ideas or cool things, you can also fix things that are broken and prolong the life or augment products that already exist. This is a personal thing that happened to me. I was in Australia at the time. My kid's stroller broke. It was out of warranty. The closest um, repair place was in Sydney. And it would have cost me at least $250 to send this stroller off to the repair people. They replace the part, send it back to me, and $250, $250 expensive. Um, I couldn't find any replacement parts online, but I did find one guy in New Zealand who was showing how you could bust open the stroller and find parts and see what to do with them. So with a, um, a bottle opener and a butter knife, I cracked open my kid's stroller, 
found the part that was broken. A, a simple alloy part is basically one form extruded, simple for someone who can 3D model. It took me probably five minutes. I printed it out in stainless steel, so my replacement part is of better quality than the original part. It cost me $25, and um, the manufacturers did not see a cent, and I win. I also made the part available, <laughs> thank you. And also my wife finally w um, thought that I was on a, onto a good thing with 3D printing. <laughs> I also made the part available for free download, so anyone else can repair their product using this same process. And I can see when people are using the print that I've got online, and about once or twice a week, somebody repairs their stroller with the same replacement part. And Bugaboo, again, did not get a cent. Uh, one company who sort of saw the, the value in this is Teenage Engineering. Now, they make these cool micro synthesizers, and um, they had these, had, they've got these legion of fans who think they're cool because they're cool. Um, they made these little knob add-ons so you can like put a rubber band on the knob and then twang it on the side and it plays like a guitar sort of thing, all these weird kooky things. And they cost, you know, let's say 60 cents to produce and let's say $30 to ship from Sweden where Teenage Engineering are from to the US. The customers weren't really that happy about um, spending so much on postage and they weren't buying this product. And so eventually Teenage Engineering um, thought why, why keep their customers from their product? And they released the CAD files for free downloads. So anyone with a MakerBot or a, an Ultimaker or a RepRap or access to Shapeways can 3D print those parts and do them themselves. So it's a way for, te for Teenage Engineering to add value to their product without any investment. And Nokia had a shot at it as well. So they released the, the rear case of one of their recent phones. So you can download the STL file and print it out for yourself or modify it. You want to make it so it goes onto your horse's bridle if you're in 1932. You can do anything you want because um, they've released this file. And it's a way for Nokia to add value to their products without any investment whatsoever in manufacturing. You can do the impossible. So this is a 17 by 17 Rubik's Cube. If Good luck with that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, this is by a um, twisty puzzle genius called Oscar van der Venter. He wanted it. He made it. Um, he wanted to take it to market. If he went to Has Hasbro or Mattel and said, I've got a 17 by 17 Rubik's Cube, they would have said, the door's just over there. <laughs> Off you go. But because he can 3D print it on demand, um, he sold three or four of them and made a decent profit each time it sells. And we also made this world's smallest Rubik's Cube. So he can make anything that would be otherwise impossible with 3D printing. Um, we're starting to see it in fashion. We recently did this with Dita Von Teese. We custom um, 3D printed a, a robe, especially for her. It isn't the first 3D printed dress, but it's the first one that she wore and that fitted her exactly. Um, 3D printing is also really, really good for connecting things to things. I don't know if you can see it very well. In the top right-hand corner is a small piece of plastic that's 3D printed that connects a Coke bottle to a bike to become a mudguard. It's pure genius. That's all I can say. Um, and we can make products that have meaning. Like everything that's mass produced, you buy it off the shelf, you may have a story if it took you three months to, or let's say more realistically, three hours to find a gift for your wife or loved one. And it's got this certain level of meaning to it. But if you've made it yourself or customised it yourself or been involved in it in some way, there's a level of meaning involved in that which is far beyond the cost of materials itself. So uh, this, this uh, pendant was designed-ish by a guy. So he, this guy met this girl in Europe. He fell in love with her. Um, he, you know, said his underdying love forever. Blah 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 blah. Um, she, she said she wanted this pendant. He said, "Cool, I'll get it for you." She said, "Ah, but it's not available anymore." And so he trailed, he trawled the internet to find this part. He couldn't find this, this pendant anywhere. And so he learnt how to 3D model um, this basic snowflake thing. He got 160 Swarovski crystals and embedded them himself by hand. He sent it off across the, the ocean to, because he was in the States at the time, she was in Europe, for Christmas. Um, it got lost in the post. He didn't hear from her for six weeks. Finally it arrived and she was blown away and her, her heart is his. And he said when he sent it off that he felt like he sent off a part of himself. And I think that's, you know, the, the meaning is, is so deep when you've made something yourself or customised it or been involved in the production of a, of a product. The other thing that's really important um, looking to the future is materials. As I said, 3D, printed, 3D printing started off with really base materials, really bad quality printing, and it's gotten so much better over time. Especially with the desktop machines, they started off pretty rough, but now they're amazing. And they've, they've increased so well in the last four years because the patent had expired for that process, which meant people can innovate really, really fast and work on each other's 
um, previous designs and grow really, really quickly. It's not happening so much in the, in the industrial area where everyone's holding on to their secrets still, but the openness of 3D printing is what's making this growth massive and we need to really, really encourage that and encourage the sharing of ideas. I think uh, yesterday or today a guy um, uh, released a design for a, a hopper basically to melt down normal plastic beads to make into filament because the cost of filament costs $40 a kilogram the cost of the beads for the same kilogram is about five to ten dollars. So suddenly we, we have the control of material taken away from the manufacturers and to anyone really. And it's not a far step from being able to grind down plastic beads to grind down previous prints and recycle bad prints or excess stuff. So it's really, really good this is open source. The other thing that's super important as well as the materials and processes is how we access 3D printing. And we see um, lots of simple tools come at the bottom end, like um, 123D Design, uh, Tinkercad, Autodesk Catch, um, lots of simple tools. And at the same time, we see really intelligent tools coming through, like, like Nervous System use where they grow designs. But what's really powerful is that, um, like the customizer that um, uh, MakerBot are using, using OpenSCAD, they can plug into an API to um, produce these products. So people can design apps to make products. So instead of designing the product itself, which is good for one person, you can design a set of algorithms or a set of parameters that can be changed to make um, customized products for people who can't 3D model. And this is where the future of 3D printing will really grow really quickly, is when there's more of these apps available so anyone can make anything they want. Thank you. Excellent. So is this exciting or what? I mean, it's clear that the future is, uh, is already here and that the future is no longer what it used to be. Um, but it's really a, a, a phenomenal. And I think what we want to be able to do is, is see if we can't drive these guys forward and think into the future about uh, where we're going. And, and we've clearly seen a ton of uh, materials. And let's start there in terms of talking about where materials are going. And some people are looking at multi-materials in, in the same... Uh, type of things. There's these uh, uh, professors at Cornell that are talking about actually being able to print electronics directly into the the print, so that you could actually have a robot that would walk off of the the plate. Where where do you guys think this is uh, going ten years from now in terms of the types of um, materials that that could be possible? Well. <clears throat> um, Multi material printing is possible now in. Basically, the object machine can print variations of an acrylic polymer. So you can do a gradient from a very, very hard plastic to a very, very soft plastic, or a clear plastic to a dark plastic in one print, like within a 15 gradient. So the, the concept is there, the proof is there. It's about matching materials which are very dissimilar, which is, which, which is harder. Now it's possible, and um, the more open source 3 printers we see using it, the better it is. But it's already happening, and so it's not that far of a stretch to have a printer that prints hard plastic and soft plastic, and a printer that prints a conductive and non-conductive plastic. It's very, very close. The future's already here. Anybody else on materials? There's, uh, it's not so much uh, multi-materials, but uh, multiple uh, densities. Uh, that's actually a really important aspect of of a lot of products out there. Um, if you can actually vary the density of one material, you can actually create something that's like seems soft on one side, but it's actually hard. Like for example, let's say um, a toothbrush. Some parts of it are very soft and the rest of it's kind of hard, you know, for grip, right? Well, if you have one material, I mean, sure, and it's slightly different colors and something like that. Yeah, you, but you can vary the density. You can't, it's very difficult to make multiple materials as uh, Warren uh, explained, but if they can actually, and there is a possibility for creating multiple you know, densities, then you could actually make that toothbrush. It's kind of soft on one side and solid on the inside. Yeah, and that's already totally possible. So with laser sintering, um, you're using a laser to solidify a powder into a solid, and the existing powder becomes support material. So you can already do like bone density type things. Mm -hmm. So that's totally doable now, and that's, that's not a problem at all. And it's really, really smart. So if you want to design a, um, a bracket for a microphone, it doesn't have to be solid block, solid block holder. It can be, as you said, test stress, make the bone like function grow there so it's thicker here, thinner here, thicker here, more porous in the center, like a bone does. Like bones know how to grow. We just need to learn how to design like bones design. Yeah, that was that was kind of the sort of inspiration for some of our column pieces that we were varying the 
the essentially the structure of via you know evolutionary CAD is is essentially you know your the human bone, which it grows based on how you walk around, the gravity, and you know the forces that you uh, you put on it. So on our end, we're looking at recycled materials, and there's a good inspiration of. Uh, there's a story of a gentleman, uh, I believe it was in Africa, and he has a, an extruder, and it's a very large, old, like from, I, I want to say almost like the, the 50s extruder. And he pays children in, in his city to go around and pick up those plastic bags that we always see up in the trees and whatnot. And he pays them, I don't know, five cents a pound or something something crazy. And they run and they there's no more litter. They pick up all the plastic, they bring it back, they grind it up in, in a really rough, almost like a tree uh, limb grinder. And then they extrude it into fence posts, and it's it's neat because he's getting rid. He's providing some uh, jobs basically for some some in an area where there's really not much, uh, eliminating the pollution, which is these plastic bags. He's extruding these beams, which then also prevents the use of wood. Uh, they don't have to cut down trees to make fence posts, and they can use it for sh some structural materials. So where I see it going is 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 sort of in that direction as far as uh, what you might do with local materials uh, and this is extruded but in 3D printing as well. I think of cardboard, I think of paper, um, resins, uh, things that are available maybe in one particular uh, part of the country or the globe that aren't available someplace else. Yeah, we could mine the Pacific and get all that plastic out and use yeah. that. For the, yeah. <laughs> so actually my my guy in the back thought of that. So <laughs> the trick is to figure out how to, how do you the uh, there's that swirl those yeah. sections the of gyre, yeah yeah and, and, yeah, yeah. and all that is and, and also too that stuff is ground very fine it's almost Perfect. like a soup I don't know if you've seen any of that stuff but it's I can assure you it's out there so we can put it to work making things in the future mm -hmm. phenomenal and and so one of the things that you know how do we make this um, uh, accessible to to people I mean some of you have talked about these customizers and and the important role that that they play and. And you know, I think of it about it like personal computers. They really took off once people became, once we had the graphical user interface, and and now we're seeing people uh, develop uh, easier to use scanning technologies. So where are we heading with the kind of the I I creation of content in terms of making it easier to to do? Where do you see this? There's one aspect of accessibility that, that I wanted to address that really doesn't have to do so much with content, but the accessibility of the material you work with. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there, we've got all these objects here that are made with PLA and one object that's made with ABS. The first thing I noticed when I started printing at home, and this was easy to notice because my, my office with my printer is right next to my bedroom, is that when you print with ABS, it, it smells like a skunk moved in with you. Whereas when you print with PLA, if you get your nose right up to it, um, you might smell a faint smell of waffles. And that is going to have a lot to do with accessibility in terms of you know, if you're an evangelist for this stuff and you're going to your local school or library and you're saying, hey, you should get a 3D printer in here because in terms of getting content created, there's nothing better than unleashing some kids with, I don't care what 3D modeling program it is, you know, the simpler the better. Uh, Tinkercad, 3D10, 123D, whatever it is, um, OpenSCAD, you know, that's my personal favorite. Um, but, um, you know, you get kids in a room with this and they're going to go crazy with it. But if you get kids in a room with it and they start having, you know, respiratory irritation, <laughs> um, it, the, the experiment is going to be over pretty quick. So um, if th the fact that we're we're already working with um, not just an environmental friendly printing material, but a material that's also, you know, kind of friendly to people and animals and things like that. I think that's a huge aspect of accessibility, and I, and I hope that we see that continue because there, to go back to the talk about materials, just because we can print with some really cool resins doesn't mean, you know, that we should, at least in our house, but in our factories, maybe. Um. And, and with that, none of the industrial printers run recycled material at this point in time. Thank you. Yeah. I, you know, I love the fact that the, uh, the, the recycler machine that this guy won this uh, prize on, he's an 86-year-old retired engineer. You know, he was just hanging out at home, and he figured out a way to do this. I mean, it's a phenomenal um, story. But how do you, you know, it used to be that the, um, you know, the only replicator was on the Starship Enterprise. And, uh, how, how, you know, uh, 
uh, with PCs, right, we used to have mainframes only in universities, and, and still a lot of 3D printers are only accessible in, in universities. So how do, how do we, you know, where are they going to go? I mean, I, I noticed in the Netherlands they've got staples where you can go and you can 3D print stuff at a, at a local staples. Um, but are they going to be in schools, in malls, in homes, uh, everywhere, or where are we going to see them? All, all of the above. Yeah. 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 I mean, I, with, with printers being $2,000 and less, um, you know, my two favorite printers also happen to be the ones that I own. One is a $500 printer bot junior. The other is a whatever $2,100 replicator too. And they're both delightful. I recommend them both to anybody. But, you know, if you can, I mean, at, at $500, that's, you know, that's affordable for, for a, a lot of folks. You know, people could pool their money together and get one for their library or, um, or even, you know, but even then going from 500 to 2100 isn't isn't going to be a killer. I think it's it's very affordable, especially compared to what what people pay for computers and um, all sorts of other bizarre equipment that eventually gets, you know, eventually becomes obsolete and um, depreciated and recycled. Yeah, I think that uh, generally these kind of printers are just going to be the the number of companies making these machines are going to proliferate because you have a printer that can make more printers. It's a win win for everyone, um, and not only that. I mean, we also forget that we can also upgrade these machines. Uh, people can come up with improvements upon it. That's the genesis of the RipRap project, which was also led to MakerBot. Uh, essentially, people are working together to come up with better ways of, of getting their machine and improving upon it. Um, in many ways, you know, hackers manage to make their computers, you know, overclock their CPUs and so forth. Um, so to answer your question, yeah, there's just going to be more and more machines. It's just going to there's going to be a greater and greater diversity of, of these machines, um, and uh, more. Uh, it's 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 going to get out of control, or already is out of control. But that's where it's going. And so we we know it's going to revolutionize every um, uh, sector of the economy. And some of you talked about kind of how it enables new business models um, that are out there, uh, eliminating scarcity, being able to print on demand. Uh, eliminating waste, uh, doing different things. But if, if if any of these folks out here are thinking about you know creating you know new businesses down the road, what are the kind of new business models that get opened up by uh, 3D printing? Sure. So we have uh, for those of you familiar with Square, it's that small white thing that clips on your iPhone or your iPad. There's a gentleman who designed a thing called Square Helper, and if you when you try to uh, use the Square, you notice if it's not aligned, you're kind of chasing the credit card around to get it to swipe. And he designed a little clip. It's, it's, uh, it's sort of a little geometric thing. Clips on the, the iPhone or the iPad. And it just holds that in place. And so you can swipe. It doesn't wiggle around. And he started. He designed it on a MakerBot. And this goes back to your point about uh, uh, tooling. So for those of you not familiar, anything that you have that's small plastic, like something like this, uh, this bottle cap, uh, you usually have to cut steel or cut, uh, um, depends on soft tooling or hard tooling. It's made out of steel. And it's made for tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of uh, uh, shots is what that is, is it's two halves, it's the opposite, two halves, solid steel comes together and they squirt plastic in it, it cools very quickly and drops out. But it, it's very expensive. So this guy came up with a design, printed on his MakerBot, and then cloned each part, and he runs his own little manufacturing shop out of his house. He's got a really cool little video. He just presses print and it runs, and when it's done, he peels them off, press print again. He sells them for like eight bucks. I think it costs him eight, eight cents or something a piece to make. And he's been very successful with that. Um, we see a lot of uh, that type of innovation. Uh, modelers as well. So we have some folks, uh, I know there's one guy in the audience that uses it for, uh, he, he models during the week and then he sells those parts uh, on the weekends at conventions and sci-fi trade shows. Um, we also run what we call a bot farm. So if you ever come to visit our facility, it has 100 160 some machines and they're running. It's like a beehive and we have bot farmers that tend it. And they, they, uh, all these are things that were made in our bot farm. Um, we use them for giveaways, but we also use it for production. So if you go to our retail store, everything that's in the retail, retail store was printed at our bot farm. And so that's on demand manufacturing for us, which we, so we're, we're rapidly trying to perfect that model and learn from it as, as best we can. I guess we have about 8,000 shop owners on Shapeways who sell their designs directly through Shapeways alone, and they're doing amazing things you could never think of. So it starts from jewelry to 
you saw the weird puzzle stuff. Um, people make internet memes, people make all sorts of different things. But what's really important is they usually design it for, for themselves or for their friends. And so they're designing to this little niche. So these people who are really, really passionate about one small thing, and once they take that small thing in their community, it explodes and becomes really, really popular. So if there's any advice I would give, it would be design something you love or want because your friends or the people in your community will probably love and want that as well. And it quickly, quickly spreads like that. If you're trying to make something for everybody, like if you, have, you try and think, ask us think, what can I sell the most of? It probably won't work. But if you really you know, think about what you love, and that's what people engage in. Um, running off that, I mean, what Shapeways does is might be similar to what we're, we're going to be doing in the future, um, but it goes like this. Um, we'd like to be able to at least have architects uh, be able to connect you know, over the internet with uh, clients or people who want to have their own homes built. I'll give you an example. Uh, ever been to suburbia? Every house looks the same, usually in real estate sort of areas. They basically have the house and they sell you a couple options, one or two or three options, and uh, you buy it. It's cheap. Uh, but there's no cost benefit. There's no cost penalty for complexity, for specialized design. And I don't know about you, I'm not a homeowner, but I, I know that a lot of people, when they buy their first home, it's, it's the pinnacle of their lives, and it means a lot. And so if they have some sort of control, some sort of, of their actual handiwork, their thoughts, their sort of you know, dreams embedded in that house, D-Shape can deliver that. And so imagine, let's say, a large sort of you know, real estate project developers having, and all the plots are going to be printed, are going to have a D-Shape printer. And essentially, a guy you know, wants, to, he wants to make a house for his family. He goes online and says, look, I have these ideas for this property I have. If you can come up with some designs, that'd be great. It's going to cost him nothing if it looks like a Flintstone house or if it looks like a normal sort of brownstone Victorian house. It doesn't matter. So that's leveraging the importance of like your attachment to your product uh, without having to make it cost too much, without making it cost prohibitive. So I mean, imagine a sort of a large community of architects, which could be personal guys, small guys, could be large firms, and they're always competing for this one guy's project, this one guy's dream to design it, and we're submitting sort of their design, their what they think is right. It's very similar to what well, my idea here is similar to what 99 Designs has with, you know, I need a logo, you know, please come up with some ideas and then you give money to the winner. So essentially crowdsourcing and 3D printing could be a very powerful um, sort of business model and I think more and more it's going to be happening. It doesn't matter if I'm doing large scale printing or small scale, it's the, the fundamental aspect of mass customization that really, really, cha really is going to make the difference. I want to pick up on something that Brian mentioned uh, earlier. He talked about kids. You know, whenever you get kids around 3D printers, I mean, their light bulbs start going off. And, and to me, this is some, an, an area where I'm, you know, personally passionate. I, I, you know, I think it's clear that this is a revolutionary technology that's coming down the pike. We're just at the beginning of it. And at 10 years from now, it's going to be even more pervasive, even more transformative. Um, and if we don't start getting kids engaged now, um, this may not be a sector that we continue to, to win, that we aren't uh, creating the kids who can help create the jobs and industries um, of the future. And I, I look at this in the, in the classroom and think about uh, kids can not only use objects to learn, you know, comparing a, a Neanderthal school to their own school or something, or, or looking at uh, molecules, but also learning the digital design uh, et cetera, that goes with that. When I was in the Clinton White House, when only uh, 50 host computers were connected to, uh, to the web, uh, we made a decision uh, that we saw this technology called the internet, and we made a decision to connect every classroom and library in this country uh, to the internet because we knew it was going to be transformative, and that took us a decade. And yet now we've got all of our children in this country growing up uh, digital natives, and they're comfortable with technology, and we continue to lead the world. So I take a look at this, and I think, you know, my personal passion is, well, we ought to be putting a 3D printer into um, every high school and every library. We ought to be getting the Smithsonian to uh, digitize in 3D um, every object that they have so that people can use those and, and, and get a hold of them. We ought to be developing curriculum uh, in school so that it's no longer just the three R's, reading, writing, and arithmetic but it's the three Ds, digital design and development. But, but so, so the, question, the question is, how, how do we think about education? How do we get kids engaged? Where do we go with, um, with this next generation of kids that we're gonna need to drive this future? The, the first thing is the interface, how they design. Like, gotta make it so they can learn. And as we said, Tinkercad is really great for 
entry, entry level, because it's dragging geometry. So that's a good thing. And then it's about what what are they going to learn? Like, is it about math? Is it about science? Is it about mm, a medical? Is it about nature? Like, so it's about what software we can get as an input for them, and that's what's important because the machines are there; they're going to work. You can plug them in, and it's done. And they get it straight away. I've like taken second graders, did a class with second graders, and they got it like that. There was no problem at all. They were they were saying exactly what they wanted in what color and what shape and simple things like a form straight away. They didn't get to the point of doing usage like a a, a functional object, but straight away they understood exactly what they wanted and how to make it happen and what shapes it's made out of. And it was it was awesome. It blew my mind. So as long as we have an interface, they can do it. So there's a really new uh, application out there called uh, One Two Three D Creature. And I don't know if you've seen it, but it's uh, it basically takes Autodesk, a, yeah. a play. Uh, Autodesk makes it. It's a, like a Play-Doh stick figure, and you can get on your iPad and or, and and move it around and and make turn it into a monster, depending on your skill set. Uh, but I think that's a really good intro as um, uh, as you look at how how somebody might interact and what you could do, and very simple. And the reward then is then to see it printed. Um, and what we're trying to focus is on how quickly we can allow people to print and get that for, we call it the, you know, sort of like when the, you can see the switch go off in their head and how quickly we can uh, make that transfer from, okay, I have this idea, I scribbled it on uh, this iPad or some future device and then it prints and you have it in your hand and that speed, that ease of use, that intuitive factor is, is, is in trying to make that as quickly as possible. Um. I, our machine is too big to be put in schools. Depends on the school. Big school. Depends on the school. Maybe the gymnasium, but phys ed is very important. Um, anyway, they can climb on it or something. Uh, but anyways, the point, my point is, is that I guess it takes it from an adult education point of view, from a retraining point of view, because as I mentioned in my presentation, uh, this kind of technology, our, our technology, essentially turns blue collar jobs into white collar jobs. We want to encourage that. And I hope that future administrations will encourage the retraining of, of people who their jobs that they held, have held for a long time, um, they're not impacted badly. Um, and I feel that getting people to retrain by using CAD, by learning how to use scanning technologies, by learning how to operate these machines themselves, they're not very hard. Um, to learning how to come up with new applications. There's still going to be people having to do design work to specifically, you know, as I said before, the potholes had to be scanned, you know, designing something to fit into a house, like renovating or something. Still has to be a lot of CAD design. That has to happen. And it certainly does start with the children, but it also starts with the guys who, you know, they want to get into a new industry. They want to improve their skills. They want to get with it. So um, I feel very strongly that uh, with this kind of technology, there has to be a very strong sort of adult training, adult education, support from government. And I, I think we pay it, we have to pay a lot of attention to the ramp that, that kids follow. Um, you know, every time I've worked with kids in 3D printers, they'll, they'll want to start out downloading something and they'll get excited and very quickly they'll, they'll say, hey, I want to make something. Uh, and the, we just need to continue to make sure that that's relatively simple right now. Somebody now, if you're working with, an, uh, with a something, say, that somebody made in Tinkercad that was shared on Thingiverse, you can very easily go from just downloading and printing that thing to tinkering with it on Tinkercad. The same goes for Customizer. You know, we need more tools um, that aren't just you know, copy, download, and, and print. More of the tools that are being used to create things also need to be um, visible to the people that approach the objects as consumers because they will always ask the question, you know, how do I modify this? How do I make something similar to this? And so, you know, those are customizer, Tinkercad are great examples of, of something where you're not, there's no roadblock put in front of you if you want to change something. Um, and, you know, more tools I think need to be like that. They need to have these affordances of hackability. So. And one other thing is teaching teachers, getting them to understand how to get started because if they don't know, the chance the kids knowing are pretty slim. Yeah, yeah I, I grew up with a computer in our classroom. It was a really old Quattra. If anyone remembers Quattra, you know how old that is. Um, and no one knew how to use it. And it was just the kids teaching themselves. The teacher didn't know anything except turning it on and knowing when to turn it off. Um, and so if, if I had maybe... Um, well, actually, no, it's a good thing my teacher wasn't around. He probably would have taught me bad things, so 
<laughs> Sometimes so, you just let, let kids figure it out themselves. So let's pick up on this on this bad thing real quick, because every once in a while, anytime there's a transformative new technology, my sense is people's minds get disassociated with the facts, and they and they start thinking that some technology could be a, is is an inherently evil technology, and they start putting uh, barriers in the way instead of trying to enable it. And and you know when people talk about uh, 3D printed organs, you know it's like. Ooh. Um, you know, people, but we're still a long ways from that. But but how do you how do you as a as an industry as a sector get ahead of um, um, some of the things that uh, you know, or what what are those things that uh, might scare people, and and how do you get ahead of them? I guess the the base thing is three D printing is a tool, and that's it. Um, like a hammer is a tool. Most people use a hammer to make something, and like one in seventy hundred thousand use it to kill a loved one. Same with 3D printing, like most things are positive, the occasional thing will happen where someone will have something which is negative, and it's very, very rare from what we see in the community, it's rare with a tool like a hammer. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the conversation often you know, turns to 3D printed weapons, and you know, the sort of traditional w tools that you would find in, in a shop, you know, things for working with wood, uh, you know, lathes, all sorts of things, would probably make you a much more effective weapon uh, than a 3D printed would. Of course, you know, people raise the objection, well, a 3D printer could make you a, a gun made out of plastic that you could evade a metal detector, but you've still got the issue of ammunition, which leaves a signature either in the metal that it's made out of or the, the gunpowder that's in it. So, uh, and you, you can chase that and, and chase that, and, you know, it's certainly... Um, you know, it's, it's it's a manufacturing technology, and manufacturing technologies don't really have a bias, you know, um, in, in and of themselves. You know, I can stamp, I can do all sorts of things with stamp metal. You know, I can do all sorts of things with 3D printing. So it's not it's not baked into 3D printing. And so we've all got a conversation we're trying to have about what we want to do with 3D printing, and it's not, um, and, and, and that also gives us an opportunity to steer the, the, the focus and the conversation towards things that are more productive than things that aren't. I think uh, another aspect is uh, it's sharing stuff. Uh, Thingiverse, GrabCAD, those kind of places are basically built upon the idea of user-generated libraries, CAD libraries, and they st share stuff. People are sometimes afraid because of a 3D printer that if they submit something, leave it out there on the Internet, people are going to download it and profit off it. Um, and that's one barrier that's kind of holding back, I think, a great deal of designers and engineers and CAD users that are in offices around the world from, from actually sharing stuff online because they feel that 3D printing will be able to easily, they'll be able, their designs will be easily stolen. Um, fair, uh, it's, a fair, it's a fair point, and we have to figure out a way of actually getting over that. So let's go to some of your questions, and Jonathan's going to run out there with the microphone, so just hold up your hand and... Uh, don't forget, we're streaming to the web and recording it, so you will be recorded and uh, speaking to the mic. OK, thanks. Um, hey, I had a question for Duan. I was wondering about color printers, because Shapeways, you have a, a full color printer that is like a powder-based printer. Mm -hmm. But uh, the plastic ones, like the MakerBot, for example, can't print in, in full color. And I'm wondering if that's possible in the future. I think. Um, anything's possible in the future. It's a matter of how far away that future is before we know. So, so yeah, so now the full color printing we have is gypsum powder and an inkjet head gluing it together basically. So it's a, it's a visual model. It's not something that's highly functional for most things, but you know, it's not that far away from being possible, I assume. It's already well, possible to a certain degree with the MakerBot. You can do with the replicated 2, the yeah. 2X, you can do two colors at once. It's a wait for the replicator 4X, I'm told, yeah. to four colors. So like the technology isn't that hard. It's just a matter of somebody investing in it, and it will happen. Um, I, I'm interested to understand, will, uh, because 3D printing has been around for a while. There are quite a few companies that own a lot of intellectual property around um, this industry. And I'm curious to, to hear the panel's opinion about uh, how some of these patents might affect the progress of the consumer market. So there was a recent uh, uh, Kickstarter project called Form Labs, and uh, they use a liquid, uh, we call it a goo printer, but uh, uses a liquid base and runs a small laser around and cures that. 
process. Uh, cures that material to make a, uh, an object. It actually prints it, I think, upside down and, and lifts it up. And it inf uh, uh, allegedly infringes upon a patent from a large industrial manufacturer, and they sued sued them. And so that's uh, you know, uh, one of the one of the the challenges is in, as part of innovation, as people start to push these boundaries and come up with ideas. Uh, Kickstarter ran into some problems with that as well. Uh, and and is that going to stifle it? Is that going to cause people to be fearful of making attempts to innovate and to grow? Um, I don't know, but that's that's one of the challenges. Well, we, we've seen when the patent expired for, um, for FDM that there was an explosion of machines hit the market for one twentieth of the price of what the existing products were. So yeah, it slows everything down and makes it more expensive. So once the the patents expire for laser sintering, for powder bed printing, for other things, we'll see much more machines, much cheaper. But, but are there still technologies that have not been patented that are still yet to be invented? Uh, yeah, of course, yeah. yeah. That's what we're working yeah. on. And, and if, if those <laughs> technologies are <laughs> invented and released open source, then they'll be shared quickly. If not, they'll be locked up with the company for 25 years. Well, they can post it to firsttodisclose.org if they want something Brooklyn Law School launched on Friday. <laughs> uh, I usually don't like to reward backbenchers, usually because I can't hear at the front of the room, but we've got the mic, so I'm going to see what the backbenchers have to say. All right. Uh, sticking with the intellectual property theme, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about what challenges you see You know, once people are scanning, say, Nike shoes or... Um, you know, Legos, cool parts, like presumably manufacturers and companies are going to try and lock this down somehow, um, which I know something Cory Doctorow has written about, the war on general purpose computing. So I wanted to get your take on, you know, what challenges there might be there. So you can <laughs> scan stuff and, I mean, let's, let's look at the RIAA, you know, they, they've tried to stop people copying music. Um, there's still great music out there. They're going to try copying. Uh, they're going to try preventing scanning from. I mean, people with designs that they get scanned and they get copied and used. Um, in some cases, it helps small companies. In the case of larger companies, they are going to pursue that stuff. But there's very little they can do. It's, it's, there's no way out. It's uh, unfortunately they're going to have to. If they're smart, they're going to be proactive and and essentially try to work with these kind of people and not try to basically bet it on the legal system. So we're, we're hoping that we'll start to see, um, let's just say with Nike or somebody, uh, we saw it with Nokia, for example, where they came out with the, the phone case and they published it and people use it, they like it, and guess what? Nokia is at it with, with even more. So they, they bought it, uh, yeah. bought into it and, and can see where, where, it's, where it possibly might be headed. So I think you'll see both sides of that. I think you'll see some companies that are very fearful and very aggressive, and you'll see others that are embrace it and, and really push it forward. Uh, one point more is that people are, don't necessarily scan stuff to copy it. They scan to remix it. They scan to improve it. They, they, they scan because they care about the product. And that's, that's something that every company should realize. They should not be adversarial. They should be like, these are the people that are going to improve our stuff. That's, that's what they should be thinking. Could the panel comment on the future of 3D printing for, you know, the output of organic material, replacement organs, and the like? Uh, I know that Autodesk are investing heavily in software for it. I know there's lots of machines coming out for organic matter. I'm not really down. I don't know exactly about the whole process and how far along they are, but I know that they're they're on a they can 3D print meat now. Apparently, it didn't taste very good I yet. Met, I met that Modern guy. <laughs> they 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 3D print uh, human flesh. It's basically to test chemicals and drugs right now, so it, it's already happening. Yeah, I should say, I haven't had the pleasure of listening to Jim moderate a panel in probably like six or seven years. It's a rare treat for me. I sort of hate the fact that now the audience is co-opting the questioning. Hello, is that okay, Jim? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, keep it going. I had some questions about uh, uh, Shapeways and MakerBot's ability to make uh, furniture, like, uh, for instance, wood... Uh, the substrate be strong enough to make like a footstool out of it. I saw that it was used to make a chair back. And are there guidelines, you know, because people will often make very kind of porous designs, but that might not um, give enough strength. So are there guidelines to kind of how porous uh, different kinds of furniture can, can be made to you know, support a given amount of weight? 
So with, with our, uh, I'll just speak for our machines. So inside of this object, as you look at it, and if you saw it in real life, maybe it was made out of marble, okay, hey, it's solid. Uh, we use a, an infill system, which effectively is like a honeycomb internally here, which is, makes it fairly light. And that's an, you can adjust those settings in our software. So you can make it 100% infill, which basically would make it solid. Or you could do down to what we recommend is 10%, which is, is, has a very large pattern of honeycomb inside of it. Um, so if you were to design something, uh, let's say, to, that was load-bearing, you might want to go with the, the thicker infill. But you can also utilize the design. It's sort of like when you fold a piece of paper. Um, you know, this the paper itself, but if you, I won't destroy your card, but, uh, you know, you can, this, this will support a, a lot more weight, the compression. So there's some design characteristics that can go into your part that I think might get you there as well as as, as well as the density settings in our software. Yeah, and on Shapeways, it's about choosing the right material and the right design. So if you make a chair which is two millimeters thick out of the, the full color sandstone, it'll break. If you make it out of stainless steel, it'll last forever. Okay, Mike, can I do a logistics check here? When did we say we'd clear out? All right. Raise your hand if you have a question still. Oh, we got a lot of questions. All right. Uh, raise your hand really high if you think you have a really important question. <laughs> Stand up. <laughs> um, I'm interested in the intellectual property and, and copyright distributions, especially with Shapeways, but um, and and other sort of like uh, distribution centers, um, but. I want to ask a quick question about, we had talked a little about conductive materials and, and sort of um, uh, producing really flexible uh, um, objects that sort of function on their own right off the bed. Um, and is it conceivable that there should be a concern for recyclability or um, trash produced um, from these, uh, like un, unrepairable robots or like uh, electronic components that cannot be like taken apart or something like that, that we get proprietary designs that essentially you um, only can use once and then throw away. That seems like it could have an advantage or a disadvantage in the long run. Okay, so I'll just, I'll just answer it. Um, the, the first part of intellectual property, we're like YouTube or any user-generated content site we um, have a safe har harbour under DMCA. So if we're not responsible for what people do on the site as far as copyright goes, if someone does something which infringes copyright and we're notified, we take it down. Um, if the in person who designs it says they're not infringing, we put it back up and it's between the two parties and they can fight if they want to. We just don't get involved. Um, as per trash, I guess it is, from 3D printing. Uh, I think if you design something for a specific need, and it um, meets that need, it should last for longer than something that isn't designed for a specific need and is just bought off the shelf. Um, there's no difference in recyclability between nylon that's 3D printed or not, and the, the ABS is, I'm not sure how that is for, 3, for recyclability, but the PLA is organic matter, so it's way better than the stuff that's yeah. in, the, uh, in the Pacific Ocean now. To, to, to add to that, you know, what we're sort of talking about here is a prototyping and invention process. Um, if I were to create a, a printed circuit board in my lab with a subtractive method, uh, acid etching, or a, a mill, I would have a, a powder or some kind of mess. Um, if, if I had an additive method for creating a, a circuit board in my lab, I would have much less of a mess. I'd have less waste. So overall, People are going to continue to invent, they're going to continue to prototype. What we're talking about with additive manufacturing is a, a way to not only make things with less waste and thus smaller, uh, lower material cost, but also that make much, of a less, much less of a mess on the planet. So we, we think it's, a, we think it's a, a net win kind of all around that way. You know, since we're in a in my classroom, in fact, I'm tempted to use Socratic method and ask one of my students to answer some of these IP questions. <laughs> but we've got so many questions. Instead, I know many of my students are exploring a lot of these issues. Take note of all these questions. We will explore these over the next couple of weeks, and I want good answers. 
Hi, uh, my name is Zeb Kirsch. Um, I'm interested in materials or objects that can withstand heat, in particular glass and ceramics. I'll be more specific. I want to make a coffee cup. So what do you think the future is of printers in ceramics and printers in glass? We have a ceramic printer already. You can upload your coffee cup design now and print it out for you. You have it in like 14 days. We've printed in glass in the past, or glass. It wasn't very popular, so we've stopped doing it. We print in stainless steel now. We print in sterling silver. Um, mechanical ceramics is also available, titanium. You can print hot stuff. So uh, I have to ask, uh, are, you, are you a big coffee lover? I suppose you are. Maybe you can make a really big cup. <laughs> <laughs> really big. Yeah, you know, I, I love coffee too. I'm making one too. You share a cup. More it's like a share a, cup. More yeah. like a coffee bathtub. Yeah, that'd be great to have in the morning. Um, I'm part of a tech startup that's uh, creating um, micro solar in the developing world, and um, we are going to be beta testing in Uganda in a couple of months. But what we really want to do is create bot farms in Rwanda, in Kenya, that are locally manufacturing with American-made machines, and preferably using re locally recycled materials. So is that doable in the next 12 months? Is that doable now? The, um, the, the machines, yes. The material, uh, at least not on our end. No, not within 12 months. OK. When do you think that'll be going? Uh, you're, <laughs> <laughs> no comment. I, OK. Uh, no. But, but we, uh, there is uh, someone who's working, I'm not sure if it's a government agency or has a grant from the government for uh, taking the machines into disaster areas and making simple things like clothespins or clips or uh, one, of the, one of the unique things about um, our machine is, is, or any 3D printer for that matter, is there's this material and it's all potential. So what can you make with it? And it's all, hey, this is all some... Uh, cool, we call them dust toys or whatever, but you could also make practical items on demand from a library that you, do, you don't have to take all those parts with you. So that might be uh, of interest to you. But if uh, I'll just offer you up if you want to come check out our bot farm and uh, I'd love to stop by afterwards. Yeah. I mean, I'd, it, I'd also like to, sorry, I just one thing uh, personally, because I actually went to three or two years ago, I spent six months in Bolivia um, as part of my uh, degree actually, and I built one of the first 3D printers they have out there. They didn't know what the hell it was. But I built a really simple rip wrap. And the idea was is yeah, we were actually we were actually working with an energy company to print a solar tracker. We were doing some designs for them because they sold lots of products related to their solar panels. So you and I should talk. <laughs> if you're adventurous and, and you don't mind voiding the warranty on those American made machines, you can run all sorts of weird crap through your 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 extruder. Um, especially if you mix it with PLA. I mean they, there's they are they always seem to be in yeah. Germany. But there's these dudes that have a wood filament, and I believe it's just wood powder mixed with PLA, and then there's uh, the soft PLA that somebody's got, and I think that's also PLA on some unknown material. You know, so you could sort of start out with a big tub of PLA and get that 89, 83-year-old dude's filament maker and just... You know, buy a bunch of spare extruders, you know, when one of them catches fire because you put something too weird through it, uh, get it, you know, put the other one in. But you probably, you might be able to bootstrap some kind of uh, weird recycling system. You, you'll have to try different things, you know, uh, mixing aluminum powder with PLA. I don't know how that would work, but I'd, I'd love to hear how it goes. I'll, I'll let Spoken you know. as a true hacker. <laughs> Um, hi, I'm Andrea, and I have a, uh, a jewelry design business. It's custom 3D printed jewelry, as well as semi-precious stones. So one of the challenges I've had is printing in stainless, uh, stainless or sterling silver. I've been doing my prototypes on my old um, Thingomatic, which MakerBot doesn't love anymore. <laughs> and um, <laughs> you don't love it. We're working on it. I can assure you. Um, and so I've been doing all my prototypes in PLA, but I'm now challenged with what do I do to create my own sterling prints? If I send them off to Shapeways, there's a 20-day turnaround, and it's $75. You could, you could cast. There have been a few folks out there that, yeah. that, that do lost PLA casting, so which, is, work. which is just like lost wax. It, right. It burns out beautifully. Yeah. It, yeah. So, it, if you, um, so we have, have tried that with PLA. So you can, uh, this model, for example, is uh, uh, one of the guys on uh, Thingiverse, and we took it, we sent it off. They, you pour the ceramic around it, and then it burns out. It, uh, if you're familiar with it, it's like lost wax. 
And then we've done it in silver, we've done it in uh, white bronze, and bronze as well. So it does work. Um, and you can polish it and, and machine it or do things after that. There, there, there are printers now that make wax. They print in wax. So yeah, it's good right fragile. No, 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 lost wax method. You just you, print this wax and you throw it into a form. You can, yeah, you can print in the nylon at shape ways and cast that as well. So there's, you know, there's, there's people in, um, in the jewelry district that will burn anything and make it into a, into a silver for you. But our uh, silver will be faster soon. What's the name of your company? Are you Brooklyn based? Okay. Are you funded? All right. I was going to give a plug for my program. My students and I give free legal support for unfunded tech startups, especially those pursuing such a noble public purpose. All right. Well, give us a call. Where's my student? Um, so I'm actually practicing uh, or working in an architecture firm right now. And so uh, I, I know of D-Shape, and you guys do pretty amazing structures. Um, but this is kind of an open-ended comment or maybe question. But like, um, so once you have this amazing structure, what, what do you do, for example, say with uh, insulation or where like um, your toilet goes, or like how do you deal with plumbing or electricity or things like that? Have you guys gone into that realm? Uh, well, obviously, no one really wants to have a completely stone house, um, stone carpets, stone cutlery. It seems silly. Uh, no, uh, architecture is architecture is the art of assembly, uh, assembling a building in some ways. I mean, yeah, right, designing and so forth. But so we we see it very much as uh, building the structural elements of a building, and you know, if we ever printed a house and you had to put insulation and so forth, we'd make room for that. Um, we, And because it's such total freedom of design, you can kind of think about, okay, how am I going to design this so I can assemble it in a certain way and i got to make sure that the insulation is put in. It's not a problem. You just make sure that you think ahead when you design with it. So, yeah, we've thought about those things. Um, does this answer your question in some ways? Termites do it. Mm -hmm. Termites do insulation in the design. Yeah, I mean, this is the other thing. It's like sometimes you got to think outside the box. It's like since when do you need insulation when you can print anything? Maybe you can print some sort of basic sort of honeycomb structure to provide that kind of insulative capacity that you so that is so very important in cold New York winters. Right. Jim, by the way, you have moderators privilege to nope. inject and questions and comment, color Keep counter, and everything. Hey. Can we talk about the future of the printing devices for a second? How long do we anticipate there's going to be a delta between industrial uh, strength or the necessity for industrial strength and personal uh, printers like MakerBot? In other words, with computers, pretty much you can use a personal computer for anything, uh, but we do have cloud servers. And so um, that's the first part. And the other one is, uh, do you anticipate a sort of quantum leap in the technology, or is it going to be linear? Uh, you know, obviously, patent release accelerates the rate of technological change, but do we anticipate any sort of discoveries that would catalyze that? So I think you always have the need or the want for um, industrial applications. So I worked at Honda uh, way back, and 3D printing was new back then, and they embraced it, and now they use it in their Formula One, or their, you know, their racing uh, vehicles. That's, that's like the primary design tool. Um, I, I always think you'll have that. Uh, I think where you'll see it is it moving into more like the military, the supply chain, um, in the industrial space. It'd be more prevalent there than anywhere else. Um, and on the personal side, of course, we're hoping it grows, but I think you'll have what we call the prosumer, which is somebody that's knowledgeable of 3D printing or design. Maybe they work at a company that has uh, large industrial printers, but they don't get time on it, or they certainly couldn't afford to buy one, and they, they have a knowledge or an interest, and they want one of our machines or a similar machine. <laughs> yes, that's, I don't think uh, that's in... I don't know if the rate of adoption will equal what you, everybody compares it to either the cell phone, the 2D printer, or the PC, but I, I think it, it will happen eventually. There's some things that will have to happen. Uh, we talked about the materials 
Um, for a lot of the machines, there's things called post-processing, which means if you if you have something uh, that's made in a, in a, in a powder printer, uh, you have to take it out, you have to shake the powder out, it might be very delicate, you may have to put it in an oven or dip it in a, a certain type of glue. Uh, you know, the objects, they come out with almost like encased in wax, depending on the design, like this object comes off of our printer, uh, as you see it, but in an object, it would have wax inside here and you have to use a water jet to get it out. So those things kind of, those types of post-processing steps would be uh, a constraint or an inhibitor to you having it in your house. You, it, yeah. At the same time though, the desktop printers now approach pretty much exactly the same as the commercial FDM machines. Like the difference between a, a, a Megabot and a commercially available like Stratasys is in the print quality is very, 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 very small now. And that wasn't the case four years ago. So as soon as the technology is available, the patents have expired, you'll see you know, desktop machines approach that of the commercial machines for sure. But the commercial machines will turn to you know, electronics and human body parts and stuff. You know? So we're, we're, I always do this in the interviews when I talk to people, but you have an iPhone or a smartphone and people are very used to this, uh, this type of technology now. And so it's like, oh, I can download an app, I can take a picture, I can talk on it, I can do all sorts of great things, I can get little, customize it, do whatever I want. And I also have in my house, I have a toaster, and it's sitting in the kitchen, I don't pay any attention to it, but when I want to use it, I go get some bread, I drop it in, I have one little adjustment, I press it down, I come back five minutes later, or whatever, a minute later, and there's my toast, just how I want it. And people want both of that, they want both, they want it combined. And so my goal is to design machines that is iPhone, with the technology and all the complexity and the cool features, bells and whistles, and a toaster simplicity. For us, it's uh, we'll never expect uh, any user, any customer, to actually use these machines. It's and it's not because we don't want to. It'd be cool if you could just like rent a machine and print your house. That'd be damn cool. But the thing is, is that there's this, the invisible hand in the market. It's liability. Liability is a huge impact on construction. And you need to control the material quality and so forth. So we never really envision these sort of things to be. They're just going to be industrial. And I think that, for example, biomedical uses of 3D printing, very, very, uh, you know, lots of regulation there. So they're never really going to get used. Um, products like this, yeah, you can see them in your house. But I don't think they're really going to be farther than, say, a fab lab or some sort of like down the street Kinko's type sort of arena where you basically sell them a the design, they print it off, and you get, that, get, you get it back more or less immediately. Let me ask this. The, are, are we ever going to see a home machine that combines uh, an extruder, a laser, a CNC, uh, that combination of fab lab kind of thing? I think the, the barrier to that is that the, the beauty of, of the extruder is that it just doesn't, make a, doesn't leave a mess. And both of those other things, you know, the laser needs an exhaust system, and the CNC leaves a mess. Um, I mean, I think you, you know, you could do that right now, say with a shop bot. They've got those guys have, you know, normally that you think of that as a CNC, but at a couple of maker fairs, I've seen them. They put a, I think it was an MK7 extruder head from a maker bot on, on it, and and it works pretty well. And you know, you, you could put a laser on that too. So, um, in terms of maybe a, maybe a single product that you go to Home Depot and buy and come home and it's got all these things. Maybe not, but I think in terms of hackers who want to go and mod something and do something really weird, I'd love to be proved wrong on that because I would love to have one of those. <laughs> so there, were, there was a device years ago called, I think it was the Shopsmith, and you bought it and it was it had every possible, it had a lathe, a bandsaw, uh, a table saw, yeah. all in one, and you flipped these levers so and it, it went in all directions. It was really cool. I think they killed a few people and they no longer sell them. But, but it's also too is is what uh, again I'm going to go back to my you know what you know, we're trying to identify okay what is the best solution so yeah the, those uh, sort of R and D dream space things are really great but then we also have to look at how many people might actually buy those and then use them and right now I don't I, we're not I don't think people are quite ready for that they may be in the future as part of maybe a mini industrial uh, thing for your garage something like that but as of right now for the consumer space I would say no. Hi, um, I'm wondering what kind of problems are left to solve in the creative tool chain. So we're talking about printers and that's perhaps like the final output. Um, and on the input side, MakerBot announced a scanner. Um, is there something in between that, you know, the, the, if you're working in this medium um, that, you know, a dream wish list of something you could have, um, what would be in the middle? Like, is it software? Is it displays? Is it, 
interaction. Um, we, we could probably all talk for hours on that. <laughs> um, certainly, there's been a lot of talk about some kind of successor file format, because right now, you'll typically use a 3D modeling tool. You'll turn it, you'll export it as an STL file, and then you'll have to slice it on something that has a lot more CPU power than your printer. So you can't just go and take a 3D CAD model and stuff it into your printer. You have to do something to it. Um, and if you've ever tried preparing a model for printing on like a very slow, say like netbook class computer, it's something that would take, um, you know, a couple minutes on a regular computer will take half an hour. And so you're probably not going to see these um, Arduino class motherboards in 3D printers doing the slicing anytime soon. So some sort of intermediate representation for 3D CAD models that um, doesn't need as much heavy lifting to slice. I think I've just spoken something that's a complete fantasy, but it would be kind of cool to have. Obviously, there's a pretty large sliding scale from your products to your products and everything in between. Is there any way to get um, some metrics of the ROI as to when this becomes cost effective and who you would use out of the panel to be able to proceed with something like this? Sorry, I don't quite understand. Do you mean from machines or like? Well, no, just in other words, if I'm going to design a product, let's say, at what point does it become cost effective for me to do it using 3D printing and to whom do I go based on how much it's going to cost me to make it versus how much I can see as a return. You know, just the, some of the economics of this. I think you'd have to price it out, you know, and also you have to look at how much time you have to wait for things to come back. Um, if you buy a maker bot and you've got, a, you've got a replicator too sitting on your desk and you want to print something, um, most of the, even the, the big object that you have there probably costs under a dollar to print. And this is, it's eight hours? So it's also yeah. to your time. You have to value your time. So if you wanted, if uh, you just wanted to run these all day and watch them and print them and take it off and hit refresh, basically to, to print a new one, you'd have to to watch it or to be available to change. But but if you don't want that material, you want something like a metal material. You want to go to these guys and and you'll wait a little while for it to come back. But um, you know it varies on the material that you're using, right? So. Yeah. But you can you can also go and price this stuff out right now. You can go to MakerBot site and look how much a kilogram of filament is going to cost and kind of work that out. You can um, go you know uh, check out Shapeways and see what you know their materials cost and the time that it takes. Um, you, I mean, the people that that I know who are doing um, this sort of you know, prototyping and design actually have both. They use their their MakerBot to do the iterative sort of design process and then when they're ready to, to do something mm -hmm. in metal or something else they'll step up from there so so if I can just add to you know DARPA the guys who invented the uh, the internet one of the reasons they're investing in this 3d printing facility in Youngstown Ohio is because they took a look at this equation they've got a wonderful chart you can google it um, for where that ROI mm -hmm. you know they make a lot of stuff um, for the defense department um, all over the place it's and like so 200 pieces uh, it's a yeah around it's I think it's a little less 200. like a 120 or 200 uh, yeah. somewhere in that range of where that crossing point is. It really depends on your design. Think uh, about that Theo. Yeah. Chance of design. It's, 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 it's all totally ch depends on the design because um, complexity adds value. Like so, if you have got something to say, if you've got a, if you're going to do a golf tee, don't 3D print it. Go and buy a golf tee that's mass produced. Right. If you want something that's um, specifically for a project or a product or to fit something or customized or has some sort of something to it which is beyond an injection molded part, then the, the, pr the point at which it's um, more feasible to 3D print goes up very, very quickly to the thousands. So it's impossible to say just one versus three versus four versus material. It's so complex. It's also the rate of iteration. So if you, every eight hours this is printing and it's halfway done, you can stop it. On our, you know, yeah. you could stop it and do a redesign and start over, and it's 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 very inexpensive. But if you're going to run it, but when you're done with your design, now at that point you end up with okay, you want to move into production, and our machine 
while it can handle production, would have for this you would have to run it one print at a time versus yeah. sending a large order to some place like Shapeways or to drop the, uh, I would guess, forty to 50000 on tooling and wait, you know, six to 12 weeks for the tooling and then have to buy 10000 plus. Yeah, exactly. Hey, there's a, there's a, I, I suggest you go on Google and look for a story. It was a sort of semi-official, semi-academic uh, report uh, by iHeart Robotics. Uh, they're also known as iHeart Engineering, and they're based in Brooklyn, as a matter of fact, John. Mm-hmm. And <laughs> so this is what they did. They had a, th- they had a thing, a thingomatic, MakerBot, and they basically printed off this adapter for Connects. You know, the Connects, the scanner, the, the Xbox Connect, for your ordinary camera tripod. So you could take your Connects and put it onto a camera tripod. Very useful. And they, were, they designed this thing themselves, and they had a MakerBot. They calculate the cost of the space, the electricity, the material, the design of it, um, the little pieces of, like, the nuts and bolts that came with the whole thing. And they basically just did a study for a year and a half, and they found out that the return on cost on one thing, thingomatic was, like, 10 months. They got it back, and they, they were selling you know, a couple every you know day, a couple every month, and not, not very many, but they were selling for 20 bucks. But this is a piece that you would have had to do injection molding on. And they only they only sold like a hundred of them, so they're definitely not within the range of cost effectiveness for injection molding. They but the thing is, and they didn't even know what the market was going to be like. They didn't know how many people yeah. had connects. They didn't know if it was actually a necessary thing. So there's no risk. Yeah. So there's there's, there's no risk, and that's an important aspect if you want return on investment. Your barrier to entry is very low. Yeah. In, 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 yeah. in either model. So if you just wanted one part, you can have that. If you want to buy a machine, you know, twenty one ninety nine is where we, ours starts. So you have some you have some options and some choices that years ago were just simply not available. Yeah, and yeah, as you said with iterating. So we had one designer, I think she's did nine um, iterations of her iPhone case in within three months. And and each one was selling. So every time she learned, she updated design, improved it, and she's ready to go. And when the iPhone four came out, iPhone five came out, she modified the file by a few millimeters, and she's in the market again with the next um, iPhone, and she doesn't have to retool or wait for twelve weeks for the thing to come back, or and she doesn't have any dead stock lying around for the iPhone four because yeah. everything's printed on demand. So there's no risk, there's no waste. There's you know the time of innovation is very very fast, iteration is very very fast. And not only that, in construction where the product life cycle of building a single building is, is, is can stretch into many years. Um, if you are trying to make concrete pieces and you need to make adjustments before the actual design is actually made, that's easy with us. But with standard sort of forming techniques, oh man, it would take forever. So for someone who's making a building and unfortunately there is some sort of, con- like re- it's constantly going through redesigns, your return on investment, it doesn't, there's, there's, there's no there's no real serious impact if you use D-shape or, or some sort of large-scale 3D printing. So and to answer your question, at least from our point of view, great return on investment it, it, for buildings at least, at least going through the risk of designing one. Um, I have another uh, IP question, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. One of my favorite uh, articles is a white paper called It Will Be Awesome If They Don't Screw It Up. Um, <laughs> By public knowledge. Yeah. Yes, yeah. exactly. We're and I was I actually come from a software engineering background. I, I can find like there's nary a week that goes by without hearing about some company using patents as a weapon against like all these other smaller firms or all these other inventions. So what lessons do you think you can, you know, as key or principal people in this new, you know, revolution that you can sort of take from um, you know, software engineering and all those patents and really, you know, trying to clean up or or you know shape the you know the, the copyright laws for this. Um, as, as we've seen before, the um, patents slowed down innovation with 3D printing. But as soon as the patents expired for FDM, it exploded. Uh, you know, we need to, to be more open for things that happen faster and better. Jim, you want to share any of your historic knowledge of the power of patents to dis- uh, destroy innovation? Well, Jonathan and I saw together a, uh, an industry in the, in the voice of IP space where a single patent lawsuit destroyed about 200 small startups um, and created this enormous barrier for entry because there's a bunch of uh, software and other patents that are pretty um, uh, ominous. I mean, this was, this was one that was clearly uh, not on the topic uh, that they sued for, but they created a $200 million barrier for entry for anybody else to get into the business. Um, and so they can be really... Uh, destructive. I mean, 
Albeit, if you're inventing something, you want to patent, you know, something, you know, I mean, that historically has been an important thing. Mm -hmm. uh, but my sense is we ought to be focusing on the other end of it. We ought to be focused on innovation, the Thingiverses, the Shapeways models, these customizers, so that everybody is creating uh, something new. In fact, I talked to the, the patent office and said, you know, they created all these little, you know, when people used to get patents, they had to actually make a, uh, a little uh, model of what it was. You know, I said, why don't we get busy scanning those? Uh, those are all uh, patents expired. Why don't we get busy scanning some of these really creative things? Throw them all up on Thingiverse or, or uh, GrabCat so that people can print them and play with them and, and manipulate them. I mean, I think we're looking at some of this upside down. Yeah, I actually want to mention two initiatives that my students have taken on just this week because they're both relevant. I had mentioned uh, uh, just offhandedly something called firsttodisclose.org that my students launched on Friday. For those of you who aren't following changes in the patent regime, on Saturday, America went to a first to file regime, patent regime. That means the first person to file the patent with the patent office gets the patent, even if someone else invented the patent beforehand. So we've launched a site, and it's still somewhat in beta, pivoting a little bit. The objective is to allow small inventors the opportunity to post their idea, their invention, to the world, make it publicly available to the world. It may preclude them from getting the patent themselves, but it also arguably is going to preclude anyone else from uh, filing that patent and controlling that technology. So they've essentially made the idea available to the world before it could be put into the hands of someone who might have more nefarious purposes for the patent. That's, yeah. Yeah, you're doing the, um, the Electronic Frontier Foundation, they're also doing that with 3D printing, so they're and Stack Exchange, I think, in uh, with them as well. So they're trying to find um, previous art in 3D printing so that uh, manufacturers don't close that down as well. Yeah, and we had tried, we had worked with a lot of organizations to try, try to create a prior art wiki. That is much tougher to accomplish. I, 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 I hope they accomplish it, but I think it's a, it's a tough, uh, tough one to, to tackle. The other initiative we're launching is something in conjunction with the Application Developers Alliance. And that's an effort to build a first line of defense for small application developers who may be beset by uh, litigation from patent trolls or cease and desist or demand money from patent trolls who otherwise are not using their patents but are just trying to extract usurious rents or stifle innovation from the small app developers. And that is a concept we essentially took from the Electronic Frontier Foundation who's sort of leading the charge in the copyright context. This is applying that into the patent context. And I think this is probably about our last question. I think we're about... Um, I'll be quick. Uh, my name is Todd Blatt. I run a unfunded Brooklyn-based startup in the 3D printing realm. Um, I make a lot of custom stuff for people, and most, mostly I use Shapeways, and I own a MakerBot, and I'm a, you know, a subscriber to Make. But I wanted to know, if I wanted to use a D-shaped printer, how do you do that, and how much does it cost? <laughs> you know, I saw, I saw the Vancouver Hackerspace guys build the Bathsheba sculpture and get the funding for that, but like... Oh, that was me. Yeah. Oh, cool. So uh, <laughs> how, do, how do I go about doing that? Uh, you want to buy a machine? Okay. Uh, <laughs> um, how do you buy a machine? I, we're not really at that point. Um, we're going around still in the process of perfecting our machine. So talk to me later. <laughs> how about I suggest, you know, uh, we have these, you know, four awesome panelists who've done an incredible job of getting into the future. But uh, maybe, you know, if they can stick around for a couple seconds to answer any last questions that, that people had. You know, we've, we've heard about them being able to make any, everything, except the one thing we can't make is more time. Um, but it's awesome. Thanks, you guys. Thanks. And while they are revolutionizing technology in the world, I, my ulterior motive for bringing you all here was to try to organize community to become a policy force to help ensure that we create the right policy, legal, regulatory framework to enable what they're doing in the most uh, efficacious manner. So if you're interested in that, stick around, talk to us, or shoot us an email. Oh, thanks, man. <laughs>